All right, welcome. Uh, we're about two minutes after the hour, so I am going to get started. My name is Jeff Gumas from Crowded Learning, and uh, today's webinar, we're going to be looking at how you can use skill blocks to create really quality blended learning lessons in mathematics that not only will suit you well um, in our current virtual environment that we find ourselves, but also Many of these things, in fact, all of these things will be transferable to when you get back into the classroom. Um, so that we're learning today how to effectively use these tools based on different elements of a quality math lesson. Um, and in doing that, we will basically be providing learners with more options for learning, again, both virtually and in the classroom. So I'm excited uh, to be able to talk on this topic today. The URLs that you see on screen are for two of the resources that we'll be using today. Um, the first one is a Wakelet, which is a great curation tool that we're actually going to use, or you're gonna see how it can be used to build out a standalone lesson for students that bring in various resources from different sites. Um, and this Wakelet in particular, the URL that's up there, the Blend My Math, is one that I've created that includes basically links to all of the different tools that are in skill blocks, as well as a number of other great math learning resources that you um, should check out because they are they're solid uh, foundational and conceptual tools that help to sort of build that understanding uh, that students need in order to succeed in math. And uh, these are the types of resources within that Wakelet that I've created that we should be using for uh, our direct face-to-face -face instruction um, that we do with students because of the fact that they dive into concepts. The second URL that you see here is a link to the slides that we're going to walk through today. Both of these URLs will be supplied to you in a follow-up email along with a link to the recording of this webinar. So if you don't want to grab them, that's fine. Um, you will get them eventually. But what I want to kick off there's a level of interaction that we're going to do today because part of what I want to provide in this webinar in particular is modeling of tips and tricks using technology that we can use to facilitate virtual face-to-face -face instruction, right? So we in our current situation have gone from having our students, you know, in person, in class for maybe 10, 12 hours a week. And that has obviously been diminished to what might amount to two to three hours a week, if that through tools like video conferencing. So part of the goal for today is not only to you know, look at these resources and how to build lessons, but also sort of model some of the ways that you should be maximizing the limited face-to-face -face time that you have with learners. So I'm gonna pose a problem to you and I'm going to have a poll that will pop up on your screen you're not going to have to go to any other places. It's going to be in your Zoom window. Um, and the question is, there's gonna be four numbers that pop up on your screen. I want you to um, look and sort of your first reaction, which of the four numbers does not belong with the others. And then I'm gonna launch a poll that asks you to select the number that you feel does not belong. Um, and this is using a Zoom poll which is something that is available uh, to you in Zoom. So I'm gonna click so you can see the four numbers. And now I'm going to launch the poll, uh, which is which number does not belong with the others? And there's a follow-up question after that. So go ahead and pick which number does not belong with the others. This has been so interesting that uh, there's been a clear winner in terms of what people select. I will leave this up for about 10 more seconds. I see a uh, little over half of you have selected. So interesting. All right, five, four, three, two, one. Uh, I've never posted this question and had sort of universal agreement. Um, there are multiple right answers. So I'm gonna share the results. And in the chat, so this, so, you know, we're thinking about virtual instruction right now. So Zoom has polling tools that allow you to post a poll like this and have students sort of indicate an answer. 
on, it could be something they've just learned or something like this, a problem that you pose up front, which I say is a great sort of dive into a lesson is posing a problem like this. Uh, all of you chose five, which has never happened in like ever in, in me presenting this. So first, I want you to use the chat window to explain anyone, um, please feel free. Don't feel like you're gonna step on anyone else. It's a chat. Um, I want you to use the chat window to tell me why you feel five is the number that doesn't belong. <clears throat> and when you do that, um, I want you to make sure when you chat that you change the two to everyone and make it everyone, which would be all panelists and attendees and not just to me. So a number of you, all of you are saying um, it's not even, five is the only odd number. So absolutely correct, five is the only one that is not even. Um, could someone come up with another reason, thinking about mathematical operations, for why five would not belong? If we're thinking from operations, so this person, Michelle says she first saw eight plus two equals 10, but now she sees that five times two equals 10. So if a student saw that five times two equals 10, then they would select eight as being the number that does not belong from an operations. Two and five are factors of 10. Um, eight and two are add-ins that create a sum of 10. So now people are seeing multiple options um, another person said they could see students choosing 10 because it's the only double digit. So 10 is a two digit number. The other ones are single digit numbers. Um, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Someone now is also saying uh, it's a prime number. Now there's two prime numbers in here. Two and five are prime numbers. But two is the only number that is both prime and even. Uh, to, to, I still would have picked five <laughs> since it's the only odd number. Thanks, Michelle. So uh, again, this is very rare that I've, I've ever posed this and everyone has the same answer. But I don't know if it's time of day or what. But this is a very simple problem that every student, no matter what their math level, can provide an answer to this question. And it gives us the ability to dive into a number of different math concepts, right? We just talked about odd and even, we talked about multiplication, we talked about prime numbers, we talked about single digit versus two digit numbers, um, we talked about addition. And when we are teaching math, um, posing problems to students as opposed to just walking through problems with students provides us with the opportunity for students to share their answers and their reasoning. And when we provide those opportunities, whether it is virtual or whether it is in person, what that unearths is the ability for you as the teacher to facilitate a discussion of mathematics, um, where students are sharing their reasoning, where students might explain the reasoning of another student. And those are the types of discussions that lead to actual conceptual understanding and students making connections between mathematical concepts. And so that's gonna be a big focus. We're gonna look at lots of resources today, but I want us to think about what are the resources that are most beneficial to the face-to-face -face time that we have right now with students, which is limited, and how can we use those to our advantage to build sort of conceptually rich virtual lessons that will definitely translate to when we get back into the classroom. And then how can we think about all of these other digital resources that we're providing for students right now and where do they fit in terms of what should be done during classroom time versus what are things that we can make them available to students during their own independent time, whether that is in the classroom or elsewhere. Um, and this gets at the heart of the issue in what I see in terms of math education. And that is that we, we see this in classroom after classroom that students will know the steps to solve a problem, but then they get confused. And that might be in a classroom setting, that might be in a testing setting. And it is because that at some point they have learned a procedure to solve a problem. It may have been from a lesson that started off simply with the teacher walking through the steps of a problem and then posing the exact a similar problem with different numbers next to it 
and then walking through that again with students mimicking what the teacher did the first time. And so they learn these procedures, but they don't understand how the numbers relate. And that's why students tend to plateau in math and not be able to advance in the math skills that they need to pass a GED or to have the math skills that they need for careers um, because of the lack of conceptual understanding. This is not from me, this uh, quote, this is from an article in the Lynx Community of Practice for Math, which is a great resource for anyone who's not in it. Um, and this gets at uh, what's called divergent thinking. And divergent thinking is the notion of thinking, diverging, right? That the ability to approach a problem with I would what is called is a blank slate, where you're, you're not sort of approaching it from the standpoint that there is a single right way to do this, but you're approaching it from that there are a million opportunities or ways for me to solve this problem. I have to figure out the one that works best, right? And so again, back to that example that I just said of a teacher, when a teacher starts a lesson by just, boom, this is what we're gonna learn, I'm going to do a problem in this way, that is the opposite of divergent thinking because that is that is sort of mess the message to students is this is the one way to solve this problem as opposed to there are many ways to solve this problem and this is uh, data from a study on divergent thinking where they found that learners who were age five had 98 percent um, scored at creativity levels or genius excuse me levels in creativity because it's a five-year-old. They don't think that there's a right way, they're just gonna do. Um, what we see happens over time is that the, our ability, our capacity for divergent thinking diminishes because we get locked into these notions that there's only one way to do a certain problem. And so the goal of our math instruction, particularly the face-to-face -face instruction that you get with students, should be to have students exploring concepts, sharing their approaches, and making connections between why different approaches work to solving the same problem. And so my soapbox at the start of this on math is that math is a language. We need to be using terms like add-ends and factors and odd and even and two digit and one digit um, because those are the, the, the words that we need in order to, for students to actually internalize understanding. Math should be puzzling. Um, there are so many problems that we can pose to students at the start of a lesson that it's not a quiz, it is a problem and it's a puzzle. And you're giving them license to explore and dive in and solve it in their own way. That's what a puzzle is, um, as opposed to a strict procedure that everyone needs to be following. And that mastery requires communication. So you, again, in class and here right now in our world, there's limited face-to-face -face time that we have. So math lessons should revolve around communication around the math, explanation of reasoning um, and modeling of the teacher of, of what good reasoning is. So today's webinar, funny, we're 10 minutes in and just getting to the start, um, is about using free resources and online tools to build blended learning math lessons. And the notion of blended learning has been around for a while, and that is that there is some mix of in-person face-to-face uh, -face instruction and that there's some element of online learning that's happening. And as you are now diving into new tools and new ways of teaching because of your current situation, um, I'm, I'm presenting this topic right now because I want us to make sure that as we do that, as we learn how to use new tools and find which tools are effective or not for ourselves, I want us to not only be thinking about what we're doing in terms of how it, how it helps us teach right now in this moment, but what are the things that we can transfer when we get back into the classroom? Because there's probably tools that you're discovering right now that are, you're realizing would be effective for you when you go back. I had a conversation with a teacher yesterday who always has had open office hours in person at her school. Rarely does that get utilized. Um, she has set up a schedule now using Zoom for open office hours online, and she just basically puts a spreadsheet with time slots in her Google Classroom um, that is an editable Google Sheet that students can access. And she has said nearly 90% of her students are utilizing um, her open office time because it is online and they can do it sort of at different times that suit them. So we're going to be making discoveries as we're sitting in this sort of virtual world um, in terms of how we instruct. 
by force. Uh, but make sure that you're reflecting on what it is you're doing and paying attention because it's going to make you more effective as an instructor when we get back to the classroom. And it's also going to open up opportunities for your students that weren't there before. Um, so today we're going to dive into blended learning and just understanding what that concept is and what it looks like virtually as well as what it will look like when you go back to the classroom. And then we're going to look at the tool skill blocks, which is again what we've been focusing on for the past three weeks in terms of how you can use that to find and organize content around a concept that you want to teach and use that as the basis for building out a blended learning lesson. And then we're actually going to see some tools that allow you to provide various aspects of a remote blended learning lesson for math using skill blocks and some of the tools that exist. And then we're going to look at a couple tools that allow you to maximize instructional time with your students. And again, that will afford you the ability to be diving into concepts and having students engaged and participatory in math, as opposed to simply using Zoom for um, you to sort of run a lesson uh, and, and, and walk through, say, a slideshow, which of course is what I'm doing right now, but we are gonna have some engagement with it. So the tools that we're gonna be using today are these. Um, the quizzes is going to be sort of bonus round at the end. I promise that this is a 75 minute webinar. So if you want to stick around afterwards, we will do a real quizzes game uh, just so folks can see how that works because I do think it's a great tool both for now but again when we get back to the classroom. Obviously the teaching today is happening through Zoom. We're going to use a tool called Padlet for a engaging collaborative lesson that we're doing virtually. Um, I'm not going to necessarily be assigning you anything through Google Classroom, but I'll go through the motions so that you see how you can use Google Classroom to assign a virtual lesson to students. Uh, we'll use skill blocks to find and organize content. We're going to use Wakelet to actually create a virtual lesson that has all of the resources that a student needs to explore a concept, to learn a concept, to get additional sort of remediation on a concept and to have practice on that concept. That's a stood up lesson that students could access at any time, anywhere. And then again, as I said, if you choose to stay, we will dive into um, a quiz together. I'm gonna stop my video because as I'm showing tools, I don't want the little thumbnail to get in your way. Uh, so as we just demonstrated, Zoom has polling. Um, and actually, sorry, I meant to uh, do another poll. I'm gonna stop sharing this and I want to go to my second poll. So of the tools that you see here on this screen, um, I just posted a poll, which ones are ones that you have either tried in the past or that you are currently using with learners? I'm gonna wait about 15 more seconds to get about over the halfway mark. Um, this is this is playing out in terms of the results that I'm seeing in real time as as being uh, sort of what's emerged um, recently in terms of usage. So I'll wait five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. I'm rushing these because I've committed to a sort of time frame, and obviously you do with your learners as well. As you've probably discovered in using new tools with students, um, you've got to afford time for students to learn how to use it, but then even when they're using it, um, you know, sometimes they're toggling between two different tabs, and that might be in a mobile device, which is more challenging. So I like the polling in Zoom because of the fact that they don't have to leave Zoom in order to answer questions. So 75% of you are using Zoom, and I bet you that was not the case a month ago. Um, so that is an interesting new technology that we have all had to learn because of the current situation. Uh, I know a lot of folks were using Google Classroom in the past, but that has picked up because it's a nice centralized hub for us to put everything. And then there's been varying degrees of use of these uh, other tools that we're gonna walk through today. So that's great. Um, again, with Zoom, one of the things that I think is excellent is that it allows for this polling. Um, if you've grabbed the slideshow, and again, I'll be sending the slideshow out after the meeting in an email, 
Uh, there, this is a linked video that shows you how to do Zoom polling. Um, I'm using Zoom webinar. I actually thought polling only was allowed in webinar, which is a sort of premium version of Zoom, but it actually is something that you can use in meetings as well. I don't know or think you can create polls on the fly. Maybe you can, um, but I do know that you can build them in ahead of time of any meeting, and so I want you to make sure. Uh, all right, cool. Th uh, someone was commenting. And uh, by the way, feel free to use the chat to ask questions as we're going. I will toggle into the chat to make sure um, that we are uh, spending time um, answering questions as they come. So, you know, we are now really in a situation where we have forced virtual practice. And so, again, as I said earlier, one of my biggest goals for this session and any of the sessions that we're doing now from Crowded Learning is to make sure we're reflecting on what we're doing and thinking about what's working, what isn't working, um, and what can we continue doing when we're back to normal, and also what has been challenging and why. So I've done this webinar once before. Everyone fixated on the very first question. Um, feel free if that's what you want to focus on, but I want you to use the chat right now to just answer any one of these questions. Um, I'm particularly interested in, in the last one. Is there something you've started using now that you will continue using when we are back to whatever normal looks like? So I want to take 10 seconds just for you to use the chat to share what you've been using. Um, someone has said they've started using skill blocks, uh, which is awesome, thank you, that's exciting, um, to explore content that's available. What other tools, what has surprised you about your own ability to pick up using the tool? Uh, what has surprised you about your students? So go ahead in the chat, uh, feel free to answer any one of these questions. Uh, I think the sharing is really important. And again, make sure your chat is set to all panelists and attendees, everyone, so that we all see your answers. We have a shy group today, so I'm not going to force it. Biggest challenge is finding ways to democratize engagement. Started using polls, um, and we'll use that as a formative check if the poll is anonymous. That's very important. Using Zoom was surprisingly easy. That's awesome. Um, and I think there's lots of affordances that that, that gives us. Um, Great. I mean, I'm excited that folks are interested in using skill blocks. Biggest challenge has been the number of students who do not choose to get online to access resources we have provided them. You know, that's a really interesting one. And we know that's kind of always been the case. Um, that it's, it's hard to get students to engage outside of class. Proudest accomplishment is how the students have adapted and are embracing the new technology. Awesome, these are great responses. Um, I think this is just such an interesting time and there's, there are some silver linings in terms of what we're doing. Um, and, I, and I hope we all reflect as we're going about this work to, to continue sort of documenting and thinking about what works. So blended learning is again, something that has existed for the past two decades and it's become more refined as we understand the effectiveness and limitations of online learning as well as have, having understandings of which sort of level of online learning fits which types of learners. And so it will constantly evolve, but the notion of blended learning is that we have online capabilities that get better and better in terms of how we deliver instruction, how students can self-learn on their own. Um, and then we have always had sort of our face-to-face -face instruction, the brick and mortar, as you see on the left-hand side. And somewhere in the middle along various spectrum, uh, is, is our elements of both online and face-to-face -face instruction that work. And we have seen research over time that, that has said that fully online instruction is not the most effective, that fully face-to-face -face instruction is not the most effective, that there's somewhere in the middle where we see that student gains uh, increase because they're getting the right blend of face-to-face -face instruction and online learning. Um, and so there's various different ways in which uh, blended learning can be delivered. We are gonna focus today on uh, rotation models. So in particular, what we're gonna look at is station rotation. And the notion of station rotation is you have various ways in which learners are engaging with content, engaging with you, engaging with each other. And they sort of rotate through those all around the same concept. 
so that they're hitting different modalities and ways of communicating and, and modes of instruction. Um, and some are gonna work better than others for that student, but they're engaging in all of them so that they get a more comprehensive learning experience. Uh, lab rotation is, is more of just sort of one or the other, and you're shifting back and forth between face-to-face -face instruction and then working in, a, in an online uh, setting. The flipped classroom is one that has uh, been particularly popular, and I think it is one that really is, can be effective right now. Um, and the notion of flipped classroom is instead of the, the sort of sequence of instruction is I'm going to teach a new concept in class today, and then your homework is for sort of following up with practice or some sort of activity or project around what you learned today. So it's learn first driven by the teacher and then do by the students either in class or for homework. Flipped classroom is exactly what it sounds like. You're flipping that order. And so what's happening in a flipped classroom is before face-to-face -face instruction, whether it is virtual or in person, the student is engaging in some kind of learning on their own, on the concept, and then they come to class having done that so that the conversation begins with students having had some sort of baseline activity or video that they work through and maybe set of questions that they had to answer about that video so that your focus on class is the discussion. So say the problem that I posed at the start of this webinar, that could be something that you send out on Remind or in Google Classroom on a Google Sheet, or, or excuse me, Google Doc. And then the students, your, their job before class is to answer that very simple question that everyone could answer prior to class. And then the focus of class, or at least the first portion of class, would be to have a discussion around what the student has done. Um, and so the notion is that the student is sort of in charge of their learning ahead of time. Um, and this is a very popular model with many teachers. And then playlist is something that we feel skill blocks really lends itself well to because this is the notion of providing learners with a range of different options on, again, a playlist format that they could work through on their own um, and select the things that work best for them based on their learning style or based on their, their sort of level of understanding as they're making their way through. And the examples that I'm gonna show you right now are from sort of really robust models, but like here is sort of a teacher who sets up a board in her class on screen that sort of, she groups her students into four groups and this is station rotation, so this group is going to be making their way through these sequences of stations or activities around the topic of uh, the day. And then this would be an example of a playlist model where the teacher is indicating, you know, these are six options for learning this particular topic. You have the ability to choose which ones that you want to do. Um, we're gonna focus on station rotation because I think it, it, it is, sort of it's the most robust for one to me and i also think it lends itself well to our current situation so the the beauty of station rotation is that it is learner focused that the learner is making their way through these various things and therefore the focus is on their learning it's not on instruction and if you look at sort of the sequence of both where learning is happening and what type of learning is happening in this station rotation model you see there's a definite role for the teacher, um, facilitation of understanding, right? So pulling concepts together, leading and guiding discussions around the conversation, that's critical for students actually mastering concepts. But then there also, there's collaborative activities where students are working and engaging with one another, maybe solving a problem and explaining to each other what they did. And then there's also plenty of time for individual or personalized learning where students are working on their own. So think about you know, the fact that lots of students' time right now in terms of learning engagement is going to be on their own. So what are the resources that we provide and organize for students so that this can happen? You know, they're guided and they have a go-to place for what they can be working on during this individual time. How can we loop that into sort of when we do get together, the things that we're going to talk about? 
And then also, you know, what are ways for collaboration? Now I'd say in our virtual world, that collaboration piece is going to be a little more challenging right now in terms of students engaging on their own together. However, um, there are tools that could support that. They could be using Remind and, and participating in chat or some sort of format of communication around something. But in the classroom, this obviously is something that can easily prov be provided because you have that face-to-face. -face. The other thing is it's flexible. The notion is not that every single lesson that you ever do is going to have all four of these things. But the notion is that you think about how can I provide uh, more than one of these things so that there's richer opportunities for learners to learn a concept because there's no one size fits all model for instruction. Um, again, all of these modalities are connected, um, but they're, they vary, right? So there's students being able to just read, there's students being able to watch a video, there's having that face to face with a teacher. Um, so there's a mix of print and online. Um, and ideally, some of that online work can be personalized depending on the tools that you're using. And also importantly is that learner engagement varies from station to station. Um, up front, in terms of how you would do this virtually and in person, communication is obviously key. I think we all realize how important communication is based on our current sort of situation. And so in the past month, I would guess the first thing that most of you have had to do is establish a sort of consistent format for your communication. Um, I would say before there was very little going on in the video call conferencing sort of mode, but in that poll that we just did earlier, that is the most utilized now, obviously out of necessity. But you obviously also have sort of these other ways of communicating with students. Lots of teachers, even before COVID-19, were using tools like WhatsApp and Remind to push out notifications. Many teachers were also using email to, to, to perform those functions and to notify students of what's going on. But all of these are key, both virtually and when we get back face to face, in terms of you know, utilizing technology to facilitate uh, instruction. And in blended learning, remember that flipped model that I said, if you use a tool like Remind, you could very easily before class, even when we get back to face to face, say, this is a video I want you to watch before Friday's class. Um, that is like that in just its own little way is providing a blended learning sequence of putting an onus of learning on the student to do on their own before they come to class and then using the start of class time to talk about what they watched, what were their key sort of takeaways from what they watched, math or any other subject. Um, the other thing that you've had to sort of uh, learn, I, I'm guessing for many of us, I've had to learn certainly, is how do we sort of organize all these things? And the number of teachers that I've seen adopting and thriving using Google Classroom who weren't using it before, um, has been really inspiring to me because they're realizing that this is a great home base where students can go um, for any assignment that I want to provide. It's all going to be right there. It allows me to create assignments and track students' progress. Um, and it allows me to integrate in some of the other tools like Khan Academy or others um, that I want to teach with. And so Google Classroom, I think, was widely used beforehand. I think people are seeing even more and more of the benefits of it as sort of a home base or other LMSs that you might use. And if you're coordinating um, blended learning, it's going to be important that you have some sort of home base um, for your learners. And so as I've said a couple times already, and as I've been doing with all of my trainings, the plans that you are, are sort of formulating right now to sort of keep learning going for your learners Think about how these things can work for you now, which you obviously are forced to do, but also select tools and processes that you want to use that are going to allow you to sort of continue some of the things that you're realizing are really effective when you get back to face-to-face. -to -face. So we are now going to start on building a blended learning lesson using skill blocks. And I'm guessing if you're here, you probably have some familiarity with skill blocks, but if you don't, uh, Skillblocks right now is really just an experiment where we are trying to figure out ways 
to sort of find the best of the best of free and open education resources and use those curriculum, even print or online resources from trusted sources like these adult ed publishers you see on the right. We've always been using these in some way, shape or form and knowing that nothing works 100% for every single learner, we've always had to pull from various um, lessons from the books and tools that are online. So skill blocks is a tool that allows us to sort of start with the skills that we want to teach and find the lessons and activities from these various sources that align to that particular skill. So again, if you're thinking about blended learning, there is a concept you want students to learn. Skill blocks is a good starting point for you to find those different resources that align to that skill and then think about which ones of these things are best for students to work on independently and how can I provide them? Which one of these resources is really going to be good for a collaborative activity that students worked on? Which ones of these things are uh, lessons activities that are going to be great for that collaborative uh, teacher face-to-face -face instruction? And so this is the starting point for finding the resources um, and there's lots of resources within. These are the five online resources uh, that are all freely available and Skillbox is free as well. And these combine sort of standard lessons, simulations, interactive practice sets, games, um, and other tools that again are standards aligned um, around these concepts. So we are going to build the Skillbox. If you have not been to any of our webinars before, um, I go through in sort of very detailed manner uh, all of the steps that I'm now going to fly through and all of those videos are on our YouTube channel. There is a Skillbox playlist that walks through the setup of Skillbox and then all of the three previous webinars are on there. But we're going to build the Skillbox uh, right before your eyes on um, uh, order of operations is going to be the focus. So I'm going to open up a new tab here and the URL is skillblocks.org. Um, I think today it'll actually finally not switch to the platform that's hosting it right now, but it will just say skillblocks.org. So that's very exciting. Uh, I'm going to go to a different account because I've already created this in one of my accounts. Um, and again, if you want to go to those webinars, you will see and watch it not work. I just said that we're uh, <laughs> we're migrating it right now. So hopefully great. Perfect. It is working. Um, so uh, on those webinars, you're going to see what skill blocks looks like from day one. There, there would be no skills in here. There'd be nothing in your library in terms of publisher resources. So I'm not going to go through that. But just as a point of reference, um, when I point out those print resources, Skillbox allows you to, for those resources from publishers that we have alignments, to pull those resources into your library. Now that doesn't give you magically, give you access to the print product. You, this, this is an indication by you as an instructor that I have this book or this book or this book. So these are available to my students. I want to see which lessons and activities align. Um, however, I've been talking with some folks who are working with students who don't have any access to online resources where you could use skill blocks to build out a playlist of content that only has the print resources. And then if you want to send packets home with those students or even just give them books to take home, um, you can do that and then can be creating skill blocks for them that just walk through the specific lessons from the book that they have to actually work on that concept in the absence of not having any uh, online access. So that's something that teachers do on their own. You have to create your library based on what you have access to. Um, and then as a teacher, you go to search for skills that you want. So right now, the only filter in skill blocks is CCRS. I am literally talking to the TABE folks after this. Um, once we have their alignments in here to the TABE test, you'll be able to toggle from the standards to TABE, and then these levels will switch from the CCRS levels of A, B, C, D, E to the TABE levels of L, E, M, D, and A. But right now, it's just CCRS levels. So I have a working knowledge of the standards, so I am going to go to where I know there's content related to um, order of operations, and it's under here under, um, excuse me, expressions 
and equations. And so I'm going to sort of scan through here to find the particular things on order of operations. Now you're going to see there's 68 uh, resources in the skill blocks library and the publisher resources that I've added to my library that align to the standards within this substandard. That's a lot. So as you start using skill blocks, you might realize that, you know, math is fun is great, but I'm not going to use that with my students. So you have the ability to toggle and just filter down to the specific resources that you want to use with your students. Um, so I am going to use that to find the particular Khan Academy um, practice sets that align to order of operations. I am going to go to math is fun to find. I know brackets is important for order of operations. I mean, we're actually going to be looking at commutative, uh, the properties of commutativity, associative and distributive property as well um, for this lesson because I think that's important to understanding order of operations. Do, do, do. So Odmas, which is brackets, you can just select this. Padmas is the one that we know we have students memorize. Um, those are there. There's also this interactive order of operations calculator in there. Um, I'm going to grab one more resource from, actually I know CK12 from their resources. And again, earlier webinars, we dive into what's in these resources, but I know there's a Flexbooks lesson on order of operations. And then I'm going to go to FET simulations because I think these are excellent for um, helping to develop the skills. And I know that these two simulations in particular are really good. So I've selected 10 of the 68 resources that are in there. And all I need to do is click save. And now all of those things are organized for me. So I'm going to enter a name for this. I'm going to call it level C, order of operations. Didn't need to have that little carrot in there. Let's see order of operations. And so now my skill block is done uh, in terms of all those resources are there. Now I may use skill blocks as just a content organization tool for myself. Um, I may decide I want to share this with students and I'll post in the chat the code for this skill block if you want to go to it. All you need to do is go to skillblocks.org and then on the student side, you would enter in this code. So remember that notion of a playlist. A skill block could be a playlist. Now you would want to organize it in a way that makes sense for learners. So again, we have an entire webinar on looking at the resources and thinking about the best way to organize them. I, based on what I've already stated is my philosophy of math, I move these simulations to the top because they are designed for students to explore. Um, with or without even any sort of guidance. Um, and so I like putting these up front because these are the things I want to teach with. These are the things that I want to facilitate conversations around and have students playing with math and discussing their observations. Flexbooks is a sort of interactive textbook, so that makes sense for here. I'm going to move my, um, my math is fun uh, lessons, we see, uh, you will see in the Math is Fun resources that uh, in brackets here, parentheses, we say which are lessons, which are games, which are interactives. So we're going to pull all of our Math is Fun lessons together here. Um, there's that one. And then this interactivity is one where students can literally enter in any equation and they see sort of the, the sequence of operations that, that happens. You may or may not want to include that for students, um, but it is a helpful tool. So now I've got these in an order that makes sense to me in terms of here are my explorations, here's my lesson instruction, and then here is my Khan Academy practice, and here's a little bonus thing. So this in itself is a playlist, right? Um, and so that's been created. So we're gonna now look at thinking about the various activities that are in that skill block and where they would fit into a blended learning sequence. Um, and so again, we've done webinars that dive into the different resources that I just organized uh, in terms of sort of how they lend themselves to different levels of teaching, practice, and instruction. But as we sort of think about that now, uh, it's sort of where can we plug them into this sort of blended learning sequence that we provide for students. And so CK12 
which has great content sets around topics that again are all in skill blocks that include videos and um, practice sets and readings and real world examples like this on unit rates. Uh, those are great tools for maybe real time instruction and diving into the conceptual understanding. Uh, FAT, which is a tool that we'll look at in a second for order of operations, is a great tool for actually live face-to-face -face instruction and having students sort of um, talk about or sort of predict what's going to happen if in this case in unit rates you remove apples or change the rate, what's going to happen to the total, what's going to happen to the price per item. Um, we have tools that, sorry, I didn't mean to dive out of there, tools that provide video-based instruction. So you're all familiar with Khan Academy. Khan Academy obviously has instructional practice sets as well as videos that align. CK12 also has videos. Math is Fun also has videos um, that provide video-based instruction. And if we think about video-based instruction, don't waste your limited face-to-face -face time on showing a video. A video is something that students could do ahead of time. A video is something that students could do afterwards on their own. So videos lend themselves to independent time. Interactive and adaptive practice. These are things that again are available in Khan Academy and CK12 and math is fun, but these are things that students can be doing on their own. And then maybe you're using some of these tools up front and making sure to use the results of these to inform what you're going to do um, during your limited face-to-face -face time, or maybe you're using Khan Academy practice sets uh, on independent learning uh, sort of um, playlists and saying, do the assessment first, because you know, if you can pass this Khan Academy like practice set, then don't worry about this playlist because you, you know this concept, right? So all of these tools afford you um, uh, engaging interactive practice for students to get immediate feedback. So think about you know, what, where that benefits you and when within any sort of lesson sequence. Um, and then this is not in skill blocks, but this is on the Crowded Learning website. We offer alignments to um, Common Core Sheets, which is what you're looking at here. And this is a set of over 5,000 worksheets that provide practice, uh, all standards aligned, to the college and career readiness standards. On the, on the web page for skill blocks that, that sort of provides information on skill blocks on Crowded Learning's website, um, you can scroll down, there's a math uh, tab that allows you to see all of our alignments in spreadsheet format, including math is, excuse me, Common Core Sheets. And so for those of you who are working in corrections populations, or for those of you who now and even in the future have learners that don't have online access, uh, these are tools that you can use to provide packets of, of learning and opportunities for additional practice for students um, who do not have online access. And again, these lend themselves well to uh, independent uh, time within a blended learning sequence. So we've looked at using skill blocks in sort of a playlist matter. Now we're going to look at using Wakelet, which is the tool that I mentioned up front, as a way for providing online lessons that have a sequence of instruction, that have instructions for students that can be done on their own, but then may also have um, activities that you're going to do together in class. So I'm gonna escape out of the presentation here and address, uh, you guys are all asking questions within, within the chat. So great, thank you. I'm glad there's conversations happening in the chat. Um, so Wakelet is a tool that, again, I'm going to send this link out afterwards. Wakelet was designed to curate content online. So for me, I use it for a number of different things. In this case, the link I'll share afterwards that I shared at the start as well, uh, this provides links to all of the resources that are in skill blocks, and I've organized them. And then I've provided additional math resources that I think provide really high quality content uh, in, in different manners for you to have access to. So I've organized all of these great resources in one place and I can share this with you or with others uh, in any number of different ways. If it was live, I could, I could open this up on a projector and students could basically grab the QR code and then get the weight on their phone. 
I can send this out through tools like Remind or Google Classroom. So I'm just gonna demonstrate that for you. A lot of the tools in Skillblocks uh, have the ability, once you're on the lesson, to simply click on that Google Classroom icon and then assign it through Google Classroom. So I'm going to go to this class, I am going to create an assignment, I click go, and like literally this all happens um, in, in, in this little pop-up, so blended learning, um, you know, explore the resources, pick um, one you want to use. I can dive into Google Classroom if I want to add more, but here I can set my assignments uh, and, and end dates and things like that, and then I click assign. Now that has been assigned to students. Now, what I'm showing you right now isn't really a lesson. As I said, this is a curated list of content. Now I'm going to go to, um, you know, this is a lesson I created last week as we were, we built this live together on equivalent fractions. And I've sort of fallen into the sequence of, you know, a nice uh, sort of sequence is having some exploration up front learning. Now, obviously my direction lines were truncated because I was doing this on the fly in front of people, but here are learning resources. Here are games that align to that sort of uh, concept of, in this case, we were looking at equivalent fractions. And then here's practice. And so I built this during webinar three, right in front of everybody, using skill blocks and bringing the resources into Wakelet. So we're going to do order of operations. I'm not going to build this live, but I'll show you the sequence that I've created. So here's this exploration. Here are those FET simulations that I put in my skill blocks up at the top. Um, then I uh, have this virtual lesson, which is the Padlet that we're actually going to dive into in a few minutes. Uh, that we're going to use for a collaborative math activity together. Then I have these lessons um, that I've put in from various sources, including um, Math is Fun. Both of these are Math is Fun. I could go to, um, you know, things that aren't in, so in skill blocks. So I know Math Antics, students really love that. So Math Antics, YouTube, Order of Operations. I'm just going to show you how easy this is to find other resources. So we know that there is a video on order of operations from Math is Fun. They have very engaging, very visual um, videos on their website. I'm just going to click share, which is how you get the link. I'm going to copy that link. And then in Wakelet, all I do is go to edit collection. And then I can scroll down to where I want to insert this into my Wakelet lesson, um, which in, in a sense, it's also a playlist, but I've, I've provided a little bit more parameters around it than in skill blocks. So I'm going to add this video right up front uh, in the learn section. I just paste that in. I'm going to click search and it's going to show up for me here. I'm going to select that's the video that I want. I'm going to add it. And then on any of these resources I put in, I can edit this information to um, provide more detail for students. So now I've added this video from not in skill blocks into my learn section. Now I'm gonna scroll down and the one thing I didn't put in here um, was, uh, I, so here, actually, sorry, I put in an additional support where I use the skill blocks as my resource for some of the resources in skill blocks are in this actual wakelet, but this skill block has tons of other resources for you to look at if you need additional support. So I'm using wakelet as my lesson vehicle, and I'm using the skill blocks as this sort of, sort of place where students can go if they want additional resources that I haven't sequenced into this wakelet lesson. Now I'm gonna add a last section because what I didn't put in here is practice. And so just to show you how I do this, so practice, um, complete these two practice sets from Khan Academy. Um, so now I've created an instruction for the student here, and now I'm gonna add the two practice sets that were organized in skill blocks into my wakelet. So the way I do that in skill blocks is I just click on this copy icon and then I can go back to my wakelet, 
when I click on plus, the default option is adding a URL. So now I've added that practice set. I go back to my skill blocks. I grab the other practice set. That URL has been copied to the clipboard. Now I go back to Wakelet and again, it's going to just have me paste in that URL. And now I've added those two practice sets from skill blocks into my Wakelet. I'm gonna click done. And I think there was an errant uh, additional instruction in there. But now um, you've seen how I've added these practice sets, how I'm providing additional support with skill blocks, how I have this, uh, these learning uh, resources that are available for students to learn the concept, um, as well as, uh, oh, I feel like I created two learns. That's my fault. Um, and then I have an exploration uh, in here at the start, as well as the tool that we're going to use in class for the virtual lesson. Now, those of you who signed up for the webinar ahead of time, I did send you an email with the link to this Padlet. Um, but this would be a Padlet that I would assign to students ahead of time, if you choose to use Padlet, for them to answer questions. And then we're going to dive into the instructions. So Wakelet is a great place to pull things together in a lesson. And again, now that I've created this in the way that I like it, I could push it out through Remind. I could create it as an assignment in Google Classroom. Maybe I'm doing that at the start of the week, right? This is your weekly um, assignment, and there's all these rich resources that are going to help you um, learn that concept. So I will send out in the uh, email after this session a few of these lessons that I've created uh, in Wakelet just to think about different ways that you might go about using Wakelet if it's a tool of interest for you for building lesson uh, lessons excuse me so we've now looked at skill blocks as a sort of playlist tool or again just even as the basis for building out a uh, online lesson we've looked at using Wakelet as a tool for creating sort of a, a clear sequence for students of things that maybe they have to do versus things that they can do on their own and even embedded skill blocks in there as a way for them to even do more than just the things that you've curated for them in that wakelet. Now we're gonna look at what should we be doing during our actual face-to-face -face time. Uh, how can we be using the resources in skill blocks or elsewhere to create rich conceptual lessons that you know, are maximizing the time that you have with students. So again, we're looking at order of operations and you've all heard of PEDMAS, right? We do parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. That's fine, but that is just teaching students to memorize the sequence of steps with zero understanding of why. Um, and this is a video that will show up for you if you are, you know, doing this in skill blocks where it's Saul Khan sort of walking through the order of operations at the very early, like 30 second mark. He literally says, this is one of the most important mathematical concepts for you to understand. And then he proceeds to just walk through the steps without providing any sort of support or, or conceptual basis for why you multiply and divide before you add and subtract. And so I've built a lesson uh, where we're going to actually do that um, using um, Padlet and students are going to explore using tiles to get at the properties of associative property and commutative property and distributive property using manipulatives so that they are the ones figuring out those properties on their own. And then once they have those understandings, building off that to understand, oh, there's a reason why I subtract last. And we're gonna do that in this last 10 minutes. So one of the things um, that I wanted to mention, and there's a video in our Crowded Learning um, channel, YouTube channel that I did last week. In Zoom, you have the ability to hand control off to students of the mouse. So you could have something like a FET like you see up here or a manipulative tool that I'm gonna show in a second. And students uh, basically can get control of your mouse through your Zoom toolbar. It's a really cool feature that allows you to engage learners in real time during the lesson. Now I'm not gonna show the FET tool that we could use in this lesson on order of operations for time but you'll see it. And again, in running, in this case, it's an equality lesson, the one that I did last week, actually. 
um, the teacher can post questions like, I've put this in the left side, how do I create an equal balance on the right side if we know that two lemons equals one apple and three oranges? And at that point, they can hand control over to students and then students could manipulate to actually balance it out. And there's multiple ways of getting at that answer and having a right answer. And so again, uh, providing that sort of divergent opportunity for students to think and share their approach, but you can also do it with the student actually driving um, in Zoom by using this, uh, what's called remote control. It's this little button right here if you're using Zoom that is available to you. We're gonna use Padlet, however, um, and what I'm going to do is I'm gonna paste this link into the chat window. Again, uh, I did email this to anyone who had registered by yesterday, I believe. So you have this link in your email. Um, I want you to, if you can, go ahead and drag your cursor over uh, this URL and paste it into another tab. It's gonna bring you into the Padlet. Um, if you don't want to, that's fine. I can do this in real time. Uh, what we're gonna be doing is using Padlet as a vehicle for collaborative um, participation. And I'm using tools, these are not in skilled locks called uh, well, they're not called anything. It's from the Math Learning Center. And these are sets of virtual manipulatives that you can use on a computer or you can download as apps on a tablet. And we're gonna use number tiles as a tool for getting at number properties, the operations properties, even if you wanted to extend it into geometric properties such as area and algebraic concepts um, such as you know, the properties like distributive property that are so crucial. Um, to uh, algebra, but also are critical in thinking about order of operations. So I will just go to this website so that you see, oh, I didn't mean to do that, um, so that you can see it's called the Math Learning Center, and this is in that Padlet that I'll share with you. They have lots of really great free resources um, on their website, but I'm using the free math apps. So you'll see they have fractions and geoboards and math vocabulary cards and money pieces, all these tools that you can provide modeling um, for students and can have them engaging with it. But we're gonna use the number pieces tool. And I am gonna just load it so you see how it works. Uh, but I've, I've pre-created um, prompts for students using this. So it's very simple to use. You can do all sorts of things where you can have groups of 10, you can have groups of one, you can have groups of 100. Um, I mean, you can even pose a problem like this. And what's the standard notation for the number of tiles that are on here, right? This is a pop problem you could pose to students, right? So it's 100, I've got 10, one, two, three times, so 32. Um, what's really great about the manipulatives uh, from um, the Math Learning Center is I have the ability to share this with students. I could either save an image and I could put it in a slideshow. Uh, so maybe you're running slides, right? You could create these and actually just copy the image and paste it into a slideshow, right? Or you could share the link with students and then they would click on that link and it would open up this screen. And then maybe your assignment is just to organize these in sort of left to right order based on standard notation. So they would get it exactly as you created it. And then they would have the ability to pull these together. You'd obviously need to teach them sort of how to use the toolbars as well as learn yourself. But then, you know, suddenly they could do this. They could even add text that says this is 100 plus 30 plus two done. Um, and move that to wherever they want. And then they can create their own link or image and send that to you. And it's, a, it's that snapshot in time for that learner of what they've done with these manipulatives. So it doesn't override the original one that you created. So it's a really cool tool um, that I think allows us to dive into a ton of different math concepts. But I'm gonna to go to the Padlet that I shared here. Again, if you have the ability or inclination, please go ahead and open it because I'm gonna ask some folks if you can to interact with it. Um, I pasted the URL into the chat. 
But now I'm going to launch the thing that I sent out to you as an email ahead of time. Now, obviously, we as a class, we don't have an established chain of communication, right? So I sent something out randomly as an email. You probably looked at it and said, that's great. No, I'm just going to go to this webinar and learn. That's fine. But you obviously have an established um, sort of way of communicating with your learners right now. So what I've done for this Padlet lesson is I've created instructions that says, please add a tile, and that's how Padlet, or at least this format of Padlet works, um, where I could share this Padlet with students. They're gonna arrive at exactly what you're seeing. And then I put directions here. Please add in a tile with your answer for problems one, two, and three. If you want to explore other learning resources prior to class, visit this Wakelet. So I pasted the Wakelet in here that I just showed you that we added those Khan Academy things so that they can go to learning resources on their own um, before class. But the thing that I'm gonna ask them to do before they come to class is answer these problems by adding a tile and providing their answer. So I'm gonna allow you to use the chat uh, or to use the Padlet if you've gone in to answer these questions. So the first prompt is click the link below, write an expression that tells the total of the red array, write and thank you whoever, write an expression that tells the total of the green array. And I'm gonna click on this link and what you're gonna see is it launches a screen that has a math, the number tiles that I was just showing you. I created this prompt in the math app here that uh, I've now asked, write an expression that tells the total of the red array and write an expression that tells the total of the green array. Now I could have students, as we just saw someone doing, add a tile in Padlet and say their answers. Um, I could share this link and say, I want you to do it on here, because remember I just showed you, students can manipulate this screen and then share it with me. So maybe they share that link in the Padlet, and then we're actually able to click and go to students' representations that they created um, directly from the Padlet. But by establishing this as pre-work, we have that students are answering this question. Now this first prompt we know there's very limited sort of options here. One of these is four times three, one of these is, or excuse me, five times three, one of these is three times five. And so, you know, the discussion that I would get into in the Padlet is, is there a difference between five times three and three times five? So now we could have students communicating just like vocally, right, over this, why did you say three times five for one and five times three for the other? Well, you know, one is the number of rows and the number of columns, and that's different because the, 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 the array has been sort of flipped in one versus the other. So now we're diving into the process of commutativity, right? That the order of the numbers when you're multiplying does not matter, but um, when, you're, when you're multiplying. By prompting students with a problem like that, by having a discussion before you say the commutative property says that the order of factors doesn't matter, students can be discovering that notion of commutativity. Your job is to facilitate them in discussing why or why not it works. And then your final job is to put the word in their mouth in terms of what is this? This is called the commutative property of multiplication. You could explore it with addition, you know, as well, using those number tiles. And so students are the ones discovering the property. It's not you telling them the property. So now we're going to move on to the second prompt that I provided. And this one is looking at, um, I've sort of mixed it up a little bit by having a single array now, obviously, we're talking arrays, so we're getting into the concept of multiplication. We're also getting into the concept of area. So, you know, how much you want to dive into those connected math concepts is up to you. But I intentionally created two different colors of tiles in this array because I want students to be looking at it maybe differently. So let's look in our Padlet. So, um, this person said, uh, Kelly said four times and then parentheses three times four. 
So we could look at that and then I could ask another student to explain Kelly's reasoning. Why is she saying four times and then three plus four? And we could get into the fact that, okay, this is one row here of three times four plus three or three plus four, doesn't matter the order. And there's one, two, three, four of them. So four times and then in parentheses, three plus four. That is telling an expression that's telling the total. Another person is saying 16 plus 12. So they took a different approach. They can see this is four plus four. They've, they've already done that step of four times four is 16. And they've already done that step of four times three is 12, or they just counted. And another thing I wanna point out with posing a problem like this is even if all students can do is add, they can do these problems that I'm showing you right now. <clears throat> right, so there's varying levels of entry points of students being able to approach this problem ahead of time on their own. And then you, as the teacher, facilitate the math connections. You, as the teacher, put language to why this approach works and why this approach works. So that's why these types of lessons, these are the types of things to be doing in real time with students. So now we're gonna get into this third one where I've switched it up a bit. And I've put a hole in the middle. Now, we only have two people participating right now in the Padlet. You're gonna have multiple. And again, I would assign this as pre-work so that students already come armed with their answers that we're not asking them to sort of, you know, do these on the spot uh, because we have limited time. But another thing about when you're back in class is problems like these, our inclination as instructors is to save our students and that is not aligned to best mathematical practices. There's a notion of what's called productive struggle where you pose problems like this to students, you give them time to sort of struggle with the math. And again, even if a student doesn't know how to multiply, they could answer this question. They would say eight plus three, or maybe they count these as nine. So eight plus nine plus nine plus, in this case, it's 16. And maybe they've counted to get that, but they're segmenting it out. That's number composition and decomposition. There's all sorts of things happening there. Um, but in this case, let's see what we have for uh, an answer. Someone said eight times three plus six times three. So I'm trying to sort of, does that, whoever did that, do they wanna provide, oh, I see. So they, wow, that's great. So they see eight, eight, and eight. So they did eight times three plus three and three is six. So six, six, six times three, and that's how they got the total. Now, with a problem like this, whenever I've posed it to a group and we're not sort of in this setting, I'll always get somebody subtracting. So they'll say it's eight times six minus six, or they'll say eight times six minus two times three. And in all of those answers, we are getting at, you know, okay, you, you figure out the dimensions, the area of the whole, and then you remove what's missing. And all of these problems are leading to the concepts that form the underpinnings of order of operations using a lesson like this. And so in thinking about um, what, so, you know, again, I would provide students with the opportunity here um, to have students. And again, I would not be rushing to the answer as I am right now, but having students in this tile sharing what they have been observing sharing their ideas around the rule that they discovered as we were walking through these problems. So this is how you take a tool like Padlet and use it to build collaborative lessons. And again, I'm talking a lot right now because we are sort of, you know, in this setting, I would assign this ahead of time to students to do on their own so that they come with their answers and then we can together be exploring the things that students have answered and have them explaining the why. Um, so that is that. And again, when you, know, you wanna show these videos, that's something you could do afterwards. So that, that order of operations video from Khan, this is a really great video on the commutative property, but rather than having them sort of presented it uh, ahead of time, 
give them opportunities to discover it. And that, uh, that's not just a virtual lesson thing, that is, again, when we get back to um, the normalcy of actually having face-to-face -face instruction. So when we're thinking about blended learning, and this is like two minutes left, I'm sorry for going a little bit over, um, we need to think about the tools that facilitate the various sort of elements of instruction that happen in a blended learning sequence, right? So Zoom obviously is what you're using for this face-to-face -face time. Um, you can create Zoom breakout rooms in meeting and have students do collaborative work in separate rooms if you want to get that sophisticated with Zoom, maybe or maybe not. But um, that's obviously the driver right now for our teacher-led facilitation in terms of the tech tool. Um, these are all great tools, WhatsApp, Padlet, Remind for collaborative because students can communicate within. Um, and then Wakelet or even Skillblocks as it is are great tools for that personalized or individual learning. And then in terms of content resources, these are all really great resources that are all in that Wakelet, that blended learning Wakelet that I'll send afterwards to use for really rich collaborative or teacher-led instruction. And then these tools that are all in Skillblocks, that is as well, but these are all in skill blocks. These allow for you to either create playlists using skill blocks or again, like lessons that are a little bit more sequenced in Wakelet that students can be doing on their own time. Um, and so as you're sort of getting into your comfort zone, you see which tools and which content tools you can use for communicating your weekly goals, what content you can use for students to do ahead of time or during class time, um, when you're gonna have this face-to-face, what tools you're gonna to use for students to do on their own for daily assignments and check-ins, and how, what, what are you gonna to use to actually perform those check-ins? Is it a classroom where it's an assignment due date? Is it Remind so you can push out notifications and just prompts? Um, and then maybe you have an end of week review where we go through students' understandings. Um, so all of these tools are available to you to be building a blended learning sequence right now. Um, another thing that I have been experimenting with teachers on is in thinking about, in particular, the things that students are doing on their own. Um, use these opportunities to have students self-report in some manner, uh, talking about how long it took them to do something, talking about how they liked or didn't like that Khan Academy video or that math antics video. Um, these are good opportunities for us because we know you know, part of the beauty of virtual learning is that learners can do it at any time on their own. Um, have them thinking and, and sort of talking about what, which of these things do they like or not like and why. And that's great sort of conditioning for just thinking about at any time when you need to learn something, what works for me? And that's a key element of lifelong learning. All right, so we are at the end, went a little bit over, and so I do want to stop here in terms of, you know, any sort of instruction on here, but another great tool that you could use either as for students to work on on their own or even during real time because it has a game based format that is really cool is quizzes. So um, I'm going to stop now to see if there are any questions that people have um, and I'll wait. You can do that in the chat. And if not, we are going to launch a quizzes game. This is completely optional, but if you've been interested in using a tool like quizzes and you haven't sort of explored it yet, uh, in 10 minutes time, you will see exactly how you can find a quiz, how you can assign a quiz, and how you can see the results of all of your students. So um, is there a certificate for this workshop? You know what, I have not been doing that, but I know everyone's doing a lot of teacher training. So I, it can only hold the value of the fact that you, you were here and that I, Jeff Kumis, have certified that you were here. <laughs> but I will do that for folks. Um, I have not been doing that and I apologize. Um, we haven't sort of officially built out these webinars in that way. But yes, I, I will do that. So thank you for that question. All right, so I am going to escape out of here and we are going to go to the last tool today, quizzes. And so this is a platform where you can create accounts. Um, so in thinking about like reporting, right? Because that is an important thing for a lot of folks. You can build a class in quizzes and then do all of your assessment for various things in here so that you get scores for learners. You can see exactly what questions they're answering or not answering correctly on quizzes. 
And that could be on quizzes that you create on your own. That could be on quizzes that you find that other teachers have created. So I'm gonna show you what I did two days ago. I did not create this quiz that we're gonna use. Um, I just searched for order of operations uh, and found a quiz um, that was in here. And here's the one that I found. And the reason I'm, you know, part, this is part of crowdsourcing, right? We see, oh, wow, this has been played 18,000 times. Uh, we see that there's a number of hearts. So we have some sort of level of validity from everyone who's in quizzes who's using this. This was created by a teacher for her class, but other teachers are clearly using it, right? So you can search by topic. Some teachers have actually created uh, or added the standards tag. So you can search by standards, which is really nice. So I found this uh, just by doing a search on the topic and then I saved it. I'm not gonna save it again because it's in there. And so now you'll see I have my quizzes over here and you can see that um, here is that original, the one that was played seven, almost 8,000 times. I made a copy of it so that I, there's like 15 questions in it. And so for the sake of time, um, I only have 11 or excuse me, six uh, in here. So last, the earlier webinar we did, we had seven students that joined the quizzes. Um, and it was a race to the finish in terms of who could get the highest score. So you can make it a gaming sort of environment or you can literally just make it homework. Um, so you can play live, you could assign it as homework for something you wanna do ahead of time. And again, that could be your driver for on say an end of week class, you assign it as homework so that you can see students' performance and then you have an understanding of whether or not um, they grasp the concepts they were supposed to learn this week. So we're gonna play live just so you can see that in real time. There's all sorts of options for me in terms of how it can be viewed. Um, there's fun memes that happen in between uh, as you answer questions. I'm just gonna use classic, the default settings, and I'm gonna click host game. So now this is where you need to engage. So I'm not gonna copy this into the uh, screen if you have your cell phone available, you can just open up Safari or Chrome or whatever you have, and you just enter into the URL, joinmyquiz.com, uh, and it probably will just automatically, after you type in join my, will say join a game. And then you're gonna get to a screen, and it will ask you to enter your game code. So uh, you go 647, 961, I've joined. I think I've joined. Oh. You have to give yourself a name. And so what you see is people pop in. Um, so I, again, encourage you, I'll give about a minute for folks to jump in, because I know this is, as you've learned, I'm sure, when you're trying to use a new technology, the first time you use it is going to be a little bit challenging. Um, I've, I've seen some great teacher uh, sort of ideas in terms of creating guides for students ahead of time um, that they can use. So in this case, they're you know going to joinmyquiz.com. Uh, they're using this code. And again, this is why a tool like Google Classroom or even Wakelet is good um, because you could put these things in ahead of time for students so that they have the one place they're going to for everything and that's the launching pad. All right, so we have five folks in here, including myself. I will wait about 10 more seconds. So again, it's joinmyquiz.com, and the game code is 647961. Um, and if you're choosing not to participate, that's fine, I get it, uh, but you'll just see how this sort of works. So I'm gonna click Start. And now that we've started, this is what I see on a teacher screen. I don't, I do or do not have to show this to students as they're going. Now what you're gonna see happening as learners are engaging is there's a leaderboard. And I think I have this set so people will see where they fall on the leaderboard as things are happening. And then as people are answering questions, you're gonna see how many right they've gotten, how many wrong they've gotten, You'll also see up here your class total. So I see the total number of questions that have been answered correctly. I see right now there's 100% accuracy of my students, so that's awesome. Um, so clearly this lesson worked. Um, 
And so we're going to let this game play out. So, so far, everyone, we still have 100% accuracy. I hate to do this, but I am going to get one wrong. Uh, just so we see what it is like uh, when that happens. Oh, I got one wrong. So we see that the accuracy total went down a little bit because of my one wrong answer. But I did that because I also want to show, um, you know, what you will see at the end within reports. So we'll be up for about uh, 30 more seconds so that everyone or as many people as possible can answer. Now, one of the things that is sort of slowing this game down if you're not playing along is I have in the default, what happens is after you answer a question, you see the leaderboard, you see memes that pop up, it's kind of fun, um, but that does make it a bit more challenging or time consuming because those sort of things interrupt the problems. <clears throat> All right, so we have a couple more folks that have uh, one more question to answer, so go ahead and finish up. And if you just want to guess, feel free to just guess. Guessing there's someone from Kentucky maybe in here. Um, Horse Girl just finished. So we have, uh, everyone is finished. And now I can click on end game and it will ask me if I want to end the game, I do. And so now what you see, and again, this isn't something that you have to show students. This is the second time that someone named ET won. That's really interesting. So, so either someone did this twice uh, or, or we just have two people that have the same um, initials. That's kind of cool. So what happens at the end of the game, um, and thank you, <laughs> Claire is clarifying that she got a couple wrong. I'm, I'm confident that Claire knows um, order of operations, but it's actually really cool that she got the same one wrong that I did. So now we see all of the questions you can click on any of these. I think you can, it's not, oh, yeah, not, not in the overview. Um, but you see at a glance, uh, okay, people had question, a problem with question number five. So that's one that we could look at. You have these game highlights, uh, the accuracy, um, the class answered, uh, I don't know, because that's not correct in terms of that. So that's interesting. It does indicate what the, the most difficult question was. Um, it indicates the longest question and the average time that students took. So I'm going to go to the questions themselves and click on this. And I don't know if my internet froze or what. Oh, let me refresh this. But you have the ability to review each of the questions um, and to see, again, which ones that students might have been more challenged by. I'm just going to do this again because I refreshed. I apologize. Um, I seem to have a some sort of, there we go, because it didn't do this before either. So everyone mastered, that's great. Uh, awesome, so yeah, when you hover over this, I don't know why that happened. It literally gives you the data in terms of how long it took students to answer each one. Um, and you can dive into the questions again and see uh, seven out of all of us, we all got this correct, we all got this correct, we all got this correct. Oh, this one students had trouble with. So now this, again, is a good driver for you to say, okay, this was one that students had difficulty with. All right, it's mixing in multiplication and division. So there is that left to right thing that maybe we have to cover because you know if you're doing PEDMAS, it says division, then multiplication, but it's actually those two in whatever order left to right, right? So you know maybe that's the, the trip up that students are having, but you get data on this um, in terms of how your students are performing. And if you've created a class, uh, you, you have the ability to track that. So a really great tool for assessment. Um, we are at the, uh, the 90 minute mark now. Again, I wanted to play that game for those of you who are interested. So thank you for spending time uh, today with me on looking at ways that we can be using all of these great free resources. And now thinking about, now that we're sort of settled into our pattern of virtual instruction, 
um, how we can sequence those together to create sort of really meaningful opportunities for learning during face-to-face -face time, and then also using these resources and making them available to learners uh, outside of the sort of real-time face-to-face, um, albeit virtual time that we have with students right now. So thank you for your time. Um, enjoy your Thursday and uh, come back soon.